Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to such a large group. I think there's one advantage of um, having this sort of new format of way of doing things. We actually get to our audience a little bit bigger when people can make it at their own time and perhaps we're not as overworked as we've been in the past. Um, yeah, so as Susanna mentioned, I've I um, been working in disasters for the last 15 plus years, almost 20, over 20 years now, and getting a little bit tired of going and seeing places that have been wiped out by these massive disasters. And I started learning about some people in the public health world that are using tools for actually trying to prevent these things from happening in the first place or when they happen um, to reduce the impact they have. So I've been trying to um, work with stealing those tools. And one of the tools that's emerged just in the last three or four years that I've become aware of in the last couple of three years is this idea of planetary health. And that's the topic of what I would like to talk about today. Um, so I wanted to find planetary health first. And um, it's a bit of a cheeky definition, but it really is after Paul Farmer, a really interesting guy who did a lot of work in Haiti back in the day. But it started off with colonial medicine, which was the opportunity to keep colonizers and their <clears throat> labor and the tropics alive. And then that kind of morphed over time to what's known as international health when this was in the post-1884 Berlin conference where they kind of carved up Africa and said which European colonizers would be in charge of the uh, African subcontinent. And they said, okay, well now we got to figure out ways of keeping all those colonizers alive. And then that kind of simultaneously morphed with uh, missionary medicine, which is mostly focused around keeping Christians in the tropics alive. Well, over the last century or so, that evolved into something now that's known largely as global health, which has the goal of um, working to keep pretty much everybody alive. And that's a, a noble effort to have. And I, I, I commend that. Um, that has also evolved into different, um, morphed into different things. Uh, One Health, which of course we've heard a lot about now in this most recent uh, COVID situation, um, is kind of the intersection between veterinary health and public health. So how do animal health interact with human health? Things like zoonotic diseases, there's a big focus of that. Um, emerging from that came the idea of eco-health, which uh, takes another sphere of overlap here and considers, okay, how does changes in ecosystems affect the interaction between people and animals and how that affects the overall health? Um, carrying on from that, um, the next kind of evolution from that is either geohealth or planetary health. And I've gotten onto the planetary health bandwagon, which says these ecosystems, animals and people don't live in a vacuum, but they actually live on a planet. And there's interactions that are happening between the different spheres of influences on these planets all the time. We really need to consider this thing as, an, as a whole system. So that's what the attempt at planetary health is and what they try to do. Going for a slightly more formal definition, um, the term got kicked off by a group at, at um, University College London um, in the Lancet back in 2015. They refer to planetary health as the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. That definition was kind of updated a little bit in 2019 by the Planetary Health Alliance. I prefer this definition a little bit better. Um, the international and interdisciplinary field focused on the characters, characterizing and addressing the human health impacts of global and environmental change. Now, that's um, from a group at Harvard and a group at UCL. And a group of us here in Southeast Asia said, you know, these are good definitions, but I think there's some few different things that are going on here in Southeast Asia. We might need to consider our own definitions. So just in the last month or so, I've been working with a small group of people to form a Southeast Asian hub of the Planetary Health Alliance and coming up with a definition of planetary health that works for the Southeast Asian context. And we here are working to understand the drive, and this is a very informal definition, we're still hammering out what we're working on here, but working to understand the drivers of the existential threats impacting Southeast Asia in creating viable and sustainable solutions for the diverse economies, cultures, and environments of the region. So here in Southeast Asia, because so many of our countries are indeed still developing, we don't want to rob people of development. And that's a very different perspective than if you're sitting in Cambridge or London, Cambridge in the US or London. So I think we need to talk about problems um, that we have here in Southeast Asia. And I think you guys at the um, NTU Asia School of the Environment are extremely well positioned to start addressing some of these threats that are impacting um, that so you can inform the sustainable solutions that we need to move forward to keep our people and our environment happy and healthy. Okay into the meat. I'm going to go through about five different uh, points that I'd like to make here. And the first one um, is very much directed at you. I wanted to say, uh, first off, I'm, I'm very thankful to have met many years ago, um, both Carrie C. and Adam Switzer. And Adam has been my introduction to 
many of the wonderful people I know there at, at NTU, and uh, perhaps a little bit more recently, a couple, three years ago, I met David Lalamont, and subsequently Susanna, and also Perrine um, Hamel, who I look forward to working with over the years. I think we can have a good relationship um, in studying these, these earth scale problems because you guys have some of the best in the business right there um, over there in NTU. So um, the fact is, however, that the earth is really trying to kill us. Um, you've seen this all kinds of different ways. We see not only the tectonic side of things with big volcanic eruptions, earthquakes and the like, but the changes we're making to the atmosphere really does make you wonder that, that you know, are we, what are we doing to these things? We've seen in the last six, eight months, we've seen unprecedented things from the fires we see in Australia to you know, literally biblical plagues of locusts in, in East Africa. And then the most recent you know, a pandemic um, to the scale which the world has not seen, certainly since 1918, in this, this rapid uh, um, ascent of it. It's really um, a frightening thing. It makes you wonder what, what's going on here. So it's incumbent upon us to really understand how these earth systems function and how we're tweaking them so that um, they're actually impacting all these systems that, that you know, really do work in concert to keep us alive. Um, the second point I'd like to make is um, this is a bit of a cheeky thing that I heard a few years ago and of all places, Geneva. I mentioned before that you know, people come up with these things in London and Cambridge, Massachusetts and you know, hearing a comment like this at a UN meeting in Davos, and not Geneva, I'm sorry, it's in Davos. There's no such thing as a natural disaster. In fact, all disasters are social constructs. That'll really, really piss off some people that are affected by these social constructs, um, including the people of Glaybrook Village. This was taken in March, of 2005, early uh, virtual reality here. I know it's probably not great on Zoom, but this is a panorama of a village where 4,000 of the 5,000 people that lived here were killed by the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. And to go there and say, oh yeah, all disasters are social constructs, I don't, I don't have time for that. You know, we, we've got to deal with other problems here and we can play with semantics like this, but, but really that, that's, that's not terribly helpful, especially when you're working in this region on these problems. Um, so what I've been working on over the last 10 or 15 years is considering what is our role as, as earth and environmental scientists in a really complex system. Um, so what we're doing here is looking at a system of risks and how these all come together to form really what is an elegant system of risk to help us figure out where to start coming up with solutions. So as earth and environmental scientists, we kind of are looking at four different spheres of influence. We deal with atmospheric um, processes, lithospheric processes, um, hydrosphere, be it the oceans or, or rivers. Um, I'd also argue cryosphere is in there at the frozen um, side of glaciers and permafrost and whatnot, but also the biosphere, which is, excuse me, more the realm of, of ecology and the like, but um, we see how these things interact. So right now we're looking at a disaster that's arguably um, impacting, you know, certainly the biosphere with this, this COVID um, operation, but some people are saying there's some impacts of climate change um, associated with that. Well, when we start considering risk, we can have a big earthquake that occurs but doesn't really impact people. Um, we start thinking about how different vulnerable systems are impacted by um, these different systems. We go to either ecologists or to people in the social scientists. And we're talking about how, say, an earthquake or a tsunami impacts um, people that live in Aceh. Well, we have to consider lithospheric processes, um, human systems, the people that are affected, but also the ecosystems on which they rely. So our, our area of the Venn diagrams overlapping here is getting vanishingly small. We have to recognize our place as earth and environmental scientists dealing with reducing the impact of risks. We need to know that there's a whole bunch of stuff that we don't know. I think I kind of uh, Rumsfeldian on you. The third part of this diagram that I wanted to predict, um, show you is thinking about solutions. Now, we, we talk about problems and we in academia are very, very good at putting out problems, but really to get to solutions, we either need to build something or affect people's behavior. And we go to engineers to look at building something, and we go to policymakers for impacting people's behavior. And these policies can be anything from the UN global policies to national policies to the policies of your mom keeping extra water or savings in the bank to reduce the risk of any kind of impact these might have. So policy can act at different scales, as can engineering. Third point I want to make. Um, and this has been a, a point of some argument amongst my colleagues, but um, I'm gonna stand by this one. The people are not indeed stupid. There's evidence to the contrary all over the place. 
um, including you know, my home country where people think it's a good idea to build multi-million dollar houses on a shifting barrier island system where you have maybe two meters of relief with rising sea levels in an area that's regularly hit by tropical cyclones. Um, these decisions are something that we kind of shake our heads at in the developing world, developed world because they have a choice. Other people don't really have a choice and they're set in places where they've always lived or they're near ecosystems that support their livelihoods. I put this um, slide in here to show you this, this intersection between the hazard and vulnerability that, that, that constitutes risk, but also the, the family that's there on the right side of the screen um, is a family that survived the uh, earthquake and tsunami despite being living about 50 kilometers south of the epicenter of the 2004 magnitude 9.2 earthquake in a coastal village because they had indigenous knowledge. So this family lives in the coastal zone. Um, they were exposed to this risk, um, yet they knew what to do. They were able to, after this strong shaking stop, they, she got her family together and they moved inland quickly to a prearranged meeting place. We wrote about this in a paper in Earthquake Spectra back in 2006. So I wanna think about why do people make decisions on, on why they live in places that could be in harm's way, and then how do they actually um, negotiate that? So in this case, it's as much about the people as it is about the hazard. Okay, I wanna take you, I'm gonna whiplash you a little bit, going from Aceh province to um, Nepal. And this is um, a project we worked on last year, we're still working on actually. Um, these are two people that live in a village. This is on the left-hand side is Fu Sang Mo, and on the right side is her daughter, whose name is Lakpa Chutsong. They live in the um, northern part of Nepal, north of the Annapurna Range in the area that's closest to the Tibetan Plateau, um, in the area called Bustang Province. And we visited these guys in their home village because um, we had heard rumors that their village was one of the first in Nepal that's gonna be abandoned due to climate change. So we wanted to go and see what that was all about. So to get to there, we flew to Kathmandu from Singapore, and then from Kathmandu, we took a short flight over to Pokhara, and from Pokhara, we took a very bumpy Jeep ride to Jomsom, and then from Jomsom, we walked to um, a place called Lomantang, which is kind of the provincial regional capital of Mustang, and then from there, after about, about a week and a half of travel, we um, took horses for a day to get to the village of Samjong, which is at about 4,000 meters above sea level. And is, it's a really gorgeous little village. And I'll show you some, some slides next to see about why they were gonna abandon Sam Jong, what was the story behind that. Um, this is what the landscape looks like in uh, Mustang province. Uh, this is actually the headwaters of the mighty Kali Gandaki River. Uh, here you can jump across it, especially in the um, early part of, of summer. Um, this was, I believe in late May, early June of last year. Um, you can see not much, um, very high elevation. The paths we're coming over here and walking down was about 4,200 meters, and we're going down to about 4,000 meters in the valley floor there. When we got down to the headwaters of the Kaligandaki, down to the valley floor, we saw this. And what you're looking at is not only my buddy's foot, but also um, accumulation of salts in the riverbed. And as earth and environmental scientists, you can you know, start figuring out why there might be salts in this river um, and why that might be bad for the people who rely on this water um, for, their, for their survival. Um, we talk, talk about climate change. This is an area where climate change is certainly having an impact. Um, the village of Samjong had been there for 3,000 years, according to the archaeologists, and now they're talking about abandoning it. So something big is going on. If you think about why people would move from their home areas, food is a big part of it. So in this little diagram from Sam Myers et al., um, we see how increased greenhouse gases can result in increased temperatures. We're not worried about the ocean side of things, of course, when we're at 4,000 meters. Um, rainfall variability, or in this case, snowfall also, and extreme weathers. Um, altered crop yields, all that leads to altered crop yields, um, reduced nutrient contact in the crop content in the crops which can grow, and also because of these difficulties, um, increases in prices, and that can affect people's food security. So when we came to the village of Samjong, we saw this gorgeous um, valley here. Uh, the white there is not actually snow, it's this kind of very, very dry area, but this very paradisical looking Edenic valley is, is really quite gorgeous. You see the horses and there's some yaks around also, lots of goats, um, but no crops. And at this point we should see the, 
um, there should be some some crops of um, sorghum, I believe, they're growing up there. But but they weren't growing it this year because they sighed again for the first time in the memory of Fu Song Mo, who was 84 when we talked to her. First time in her memory, they were not planting crops because it was just too much effort. And what I believe is happening here is their soil had become salinated, and they just weren't getting the same bang for their buck when they're um, growing their crops. Um, now to see this as an abandoned village really caused by surprise because it was actually a gorgeous village with very well kept um, buildings. You can see them freshly whitewashed here after a long winter. You see lots of uh, baby goats there in the, in the front of the buildings. Um, I want you to also remember this where you come back to this, this particular view um, at the end of the talk. But remember this, a, a really gorgeous village. So we were curious. We walked in there. Um, what was going on? What was the story? Well, we were very lucky um, to meet this guy in the picture. His name is Tashi Gorong. Tashi, um, we met while maybe having a cold drink uh, the night before. He's doing a PhD in environmental studies at Arizona State University on changes in the tourism industry in his home area. He's actually from Lomontong. He's um, ethnically Tibetan and he speaks uh, the local languages, which is lucky because the people in this village do not speak Nepali and they speak a dialect of Tibetan, which Tashi speaks. And a quick story I have to interrupt with, we're walking to the village. He'd actually never been to this village even though he grew up uh, not far away. Um, the older woman, Fu Sanwo, looks at him and says, hey, are you so-and-so's son? He's like, yeah, I am. Well, it turns out Tashi's father is a yak trader from the area. Everybody in the region knows him, and he looked enough like his father that she was able to recognize him. So she invited us into her home and gave him these traditional Tibetan boots and um, gave us some chong and whatnot, and we ate and had a nice, nice chat with them. And what we learned is, as in most cases with environmental change, things are, are very complicated. Um, where Fu Tsang Mo was, was old school and she's saying, look, we're good. We've been through bad times in the past. We're, we're, we're tough. We can survive. We'll make it through this year. Things go better next year. Her daughter with her two of her three children here in this picture had different views. And she said, look, it's time to go. This is too hard. I want a better life for my children and who can blame her? I should point out that these gorgeous pictures are not taken by me, but my colleague, uh, Tom White, who's a lecturer here at Yale and U.S. Um, this is a view from the pass looking back towards Lomontang, and you can see that they're actually carving a road in over this pass, and roads are a big part of development in this area. And it turns out that the reason for abandoning Samjong was as much because of roads and development as it was because of climate change. Um, moving from their hometown, they can get access for their children to education, to healthcare, to um, goods and services that come up the main road from Pokhara. Um, jobs, networks, food, um, etc. So the debate is, was it a pull from the road or was it a push from climate change? But both of these are conspiring to make changes in Samjong, which are likely to lead to its abandonment. But the question I want to leave you with is, not leave you with, but ask you now is, what would you do in this situation? You live in a rural village. It's where you've, your people have lived for as long as you can remember. And you have a chance for a better life for your child. Would you stay or would you go and seek these services that come with modernity and, and development. Fifth point I want to make, and this is the one I want to leave you with, is a, is a point of hope. And this is going to be a little bit longer, so don't get too happy, Suzanne. I'm going to still go on for a minute here. Um, there is hope in this, this whole thing because people are coming up with solutions and figuring out ways to navigate development in a way that's sustainable. And because here in Southeast Asia, you've got a lot of you know, very strong entrepreneurial spirit, um, I think you'll, you'll agree with me that there's this particular example I'm going to show you is, is gives me at least a lot of hope. Um, we've been partnering with a foundation in Indonesia called Alam Sehat Lestari, um, ASRI for short. And um, this is a, an organization that was founded, oh, 10, 12 years ago, if I remember correctly, by an American woman, a Yale graduate, graduate of Yale Medical School, who was doing a project in Indonesia on orangutans, looking at physiology. And as the story goes, she was wondering why orangutan habitat was being threatened. Well, she went to this place in Borneo and found an area um, of Gunung Palung National Park. We went there with a group of students a couple of years back and saw this absolutely gorgeous um, forest. It's largely degraded because they had been doing, there had been illegal, um, def uh, illegal logging going on in this forest for some time. And the question that the founder of this organization, one of the founders of this organization asked is, why are people cutting down trees in this area when they know that the forest provides um, ecosystem services that will make their life better, be it food services or uh, regulating services like water regulation, keeping down flooding, 
um, climate regulation. These things are all known because indeed people aren't stupid. Um, as we walked through the park with my students, we, we realized that you'd see these, these old um, relics of, of the previous forest. You can see this would have been a massive tree that was cut down um, some time in the past and it's already, of course, regrowing. But there'd been a lot of, of degradation happening in this area because in this area, people could cut down trees and use the profits of that to pay for basic needs like health care. So again, I ask you, if you're in a situation where you don't have access to these different um, necessities, be it health care, clean, uh, you know, clean water because of the forest, but um, health care and food and, and education, would you seek to better your life by cutting down a tree? It might save your life or save the life of a lo loved one. So with um, Kinnery Webb, the founder of a group called Health in Harmony, which is the sister organization of Osri, um, did is they set up a clinic, health clinic in um, a town called Sugadana in West Kalimantan. And they worked with local people who were cutting down the forest and said, look, if you give up um, cutting down the forest, we will um, help you out with, with seriously subsidized health care. We'll do things like if you have a chainsaw in your village, we'll buy it back for a good price. I think it was $200 or something for a chainsaw and then help you set up alternative livelihoods. So again, in exchange for um, pledging to stop deforestation, we'll give you subsidized health care, work on alternative livelihoods, and um, all everybody then would reap the benefits of a better um, environment for the people. Um, so when we went there with our students a year ago, we were only there for a very short time. We brought a drone with us, and this is an example of a site they're working on reforesting. Um, the people who live in the surrounding villages can actually pay for health care using seedlings. So if you bring in, say, a small ironwood seedling, you can get a tooth pulled. Or um, if you have a, a, a baby, you need some prenatal care or something, you can, you can trade in goods that you get from the forest or um, seedlings to help pay for that. Then they in turn use those seedlings to do reforestation projects. So you can see on the north or the right side of the road here um, would have looked like the left side of the road had you been here about 15 years ago, been largely deforested and degraded land with lots of grass growing on it. However, due to the efforts of Ossery, they've done a replanting scheme in there. We um, flew the drone. We actually were able to calculate approximately how much carbon had been stored based on the height of the trees and the biodiversity of the um, species that live in there. You can get an idea also of what the overall um, health of the forest looks like. You can see the area on the left-hand side is um, in red, very degraded land, and the area on the right-hand side is much, much healthier. And you go in there, you can actually see the biodiversity and the animal um, fla uh, the fauna starting to return also. I mentioned also that Osri supports alternative livelihoods. One of the alternative livelihoods they support is um, working with local people, former uh, loggers, to, to now find um, found organic farms. So we had the good sense um, with our student group to bring a um, Culinary Institute of America trained chef with us. She had um, worked some, for some very famous restaurants around the world, and she was gonna work with the local population to help create delicious and also nutritious um, recipes using uh, vegetables they're growing in their own organic um, gardens. So, you know, sometimes you get eating certain kinds of foods, you get used to it, it may not be the healthiest food, even though it can be very delicious. Um, our colleague was trying to work with the local community to say, let's take the, the recipes they have and tweak them ever so slightly so they're a little bit more healthy. So you start seeing how these systems come together. People start eating healthy food, there's less demand on healthcare services. If the food is also good for the environment, you start having the land rehabilitated, rehabilitate the land, the ecosystem services that are provided to keep people healthy start coming back. So it's a beautiful system and working with a, a famous chef was a real treat for us um, to have that opportunity to, to, to see. Um, another alternative livelihood that um, Osri is supporting is um, coffee growing and roasting. So we have traditional roasting techniques. They actually put rice in their coffee as a way to, I think, draw some of the moisture out and gives it a very distinct taste. And at the end of the, um, end of the uh, week we were down there, our, our chef colleague made this gorgeous platter of um, pisang bakar, uh, the baked bananas rather than the, the pisang goreng that we all love. Um, but she was able to use some nice local palm sugar on the local bananas and um, create a baked dish, which is a bit more healthy for the whole um, team that works at the, at the health clinic. So it was really a fun, fun trip we did. And, and um, you'll understand why I'm telling this because I'd like to, to consider um, an invitation to my colleagues at NTU. Um, so coming out of this, this um, one week, um, jaunt down to West Kalimantan. 
we um, decided to form a class on planetary health we're teaching at Yale and US um, called environmental, uh, Planetary Health, Environmental Change, and Human Health. The objective of this course, um, going as an Earth scientist, I want to know how the atmosphere, lithosphere, and hydrosphere all come together to support life. I want to study how people are changing these different spheres and how there's um, both risks and benefits from these changes we're making. We wouldn't be making these changes unless we saw some benefits from it. Um, we want to start talking about planetary boundaries, what the concept means and how we're either living within them or living without them in the case of uh, many of us in the developed world. We want to talk about um, how to use scientific data, um, including um, statistical analysis in, in R and Excel and also um, using GIS to look at these different uh, spatial issues. We'll be able to communicate environmental risk. We want to be able to propose sustainable solutions. That's something, again, we're not very good at in academia. We're pretty good at pointing out problems, but not good at solving them. The other things we want to do is create, work with our partners at, at OSRI to create a planetary health kit. And this is just a small um, tool set that we can actually bring down to the field. And if we can create it at low enough cost, leave in the field with our partners um, to measure things such as biodiversity in the forest, using transects, um, measuring water infiltration in the forest versus in degraded land, um, measuring water quality if there's uh, E. coli in the water or the water becoming more saline. And we also um, created some. I'll go to the next slide. I think we talk about the next slide. Uh, created some uh, air quality monitors also. So um, those are things we're, we're talking about. We're, we're partnering with uh, Austria to do that. Our plan was to go down there then this semester, but of course that didn't work out. So we actually ran the class this semester, and this is what I'd like to invite you to. Um, first time we teach the class is always new. I have to brag on Yale and US. A lot of you people, uh, not a lot of people don't understand what Yale and US is. We're an undergraduate only institution um, where we have students from only a thousand students in the whole college. We have students from all over the world, as evidenced by my class here. And this is a random, just people who signed up for the class. You can test yourself on the flags here, but going clockwise from Singapore, class of, I think it was 15 students. We had Singapore, China, Philippines, India, Japan, United States, Bulgaria, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Colombia, and Australia represented in one class. But having those ideas come together in different perspectives was really fantastic. And we looked at a series of issues around um, forests. Thank you, Suzanne, I see you. Um, forests, uh, sustainable development goals, risk, disease. Um, I say donuts in here, not because I'm American, because we looked at donut economics, which I think is a, a very good um, book for you guys to read while you're sitting in quarantine or in stay-at-home notice. Uh, oceans, pollution, volcanoes, floods, fires, and then we finished with food and famine. Um, in the class, we um, developed this we call the FRED kit, which is the Planetary Health Resource for Environmental Development. We're able to measure water quality, soil, biodiversity, and air quality. And we built these um, very small Raspberry Pi style air quality monitors for about 50 bucks. Um, we almost got them running. We had a little app we connect them to. Um, so that was this year's project. We're still working on finishing that off over the summer. Um, we'll be teaching this class again next semester. And we're gonna try to help Austria out with the virtual education offerings. Um, so we'll look at health, conservation, education. We had two trips canceled in the last academic year to go to Kalimantan, one with this class and another one was been a week long one. The first trip was canceled because of haze. The second was canceled because of coronavirus. Um, so we're starting to realize that this won't always be um, a, a thing that can happen all the time. So we better figure out a way to do good virtual field trips. But also um, Osprey is using this as a way to generate income. So as people go and visit them, they can charge visitors and actually use that to support their healthcare services. The idea I have, and the invitation comes in with an idea called a TikTok. The TikTok is a transdisciplinary, interconnected, tiny online course. I have not done this before. This is completely the first time I presented it. So I'd love to hear um, your ideas about this. But the idea would be we bring groups, of uh, groups together. Um, one teacher would teach a class, say then to you. I would teach a class at Yale and US. And every two weeks or so, we come together virtually um, or in person, we're both in Singapore, and share ideas. If Suzanne is teaching this class, for instance, from a perspective as a volcanologist, then she can talk about volcanoes. I'll teach it from a very um, broad point of view. Even somebody from economics could teach from an economic point of view. Come together and share ideas, I think would be very valuable. Okay, I told you we'd be coming back to um, Nepal. And this is um, one other cool project I've been talking with David Lalamont a fair bit about, so I want to show him some of the stuff we can do with this. Uh, we actually brought a drone up to us, up to um, Samjong with us also, the village in, Nepal, in northern Nepal by the Tibetan Plateau. And we were able to create a virtual model of this village 
So this is the actual village. And then this is a model that we created using drone data and then working with a computer graphics guy um, who's here in Singapore, dressed it up so you can actually gamify this thing and actually explore the village. And each one of those blue dots is a place where you may, we could have a 360 degree vi video interview. So this way you could explore the village and interact with locals and learn about the risks and how they're dealing with them firsthand. Um, I think we could do something like this in different places around the region. We're working in um, Padang in Sumatra with a group down there that many people at NTU are familiar with. And um, I think we could do the same thing in Sugadana, um, get to see how people live down there, the choices they make, visit the gardens and the different businesses that Osri is supporting, and then incorporate this into a virtual learning environment. On that note, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your extremely busy full days um, sitting at home and um, leave you with, the, with the, first of all, a link to um, the work to Alam Sihat Lestari or Asri down in West Kalimantan. I recommend you get to check them out. Um, this is not uh, something that's happening in a vacuum. We've got uh, partners with Asri, but also their sister organization, Health and Harmony, which is based in the United States. Um, my colleague, I believe my colleague Sumitra, the chef, is online today. If you have a question for her, you could ask her. She's based in Chiang Mai, working with indigenous populations on food security and economic security, uh, crossing globalized issues. So Suitra has also been to, down and working with Osri to um, consider ways that populations here in Southeast Asia can create solutions that make the health better and the development in these areas better for everybody in a sustainable way. And this is something that is, is not terribly common. It's very, very hard to do. So I commend all these people that are working on that. And with that, I will stop and hopefully there's some questions that are coming through. Perfect.